buying shoes. The gorgeous and talented Helena Hawk is here, everyone. Make sure you give her a round of applause. Michael Lat Latus, uh, I, I always bitch butcher it, son of a bitch. Lastuka, Lastuka, you think a Ukrainian would be able to get that one? Jim Bud, how you doing? The gorgeous and talented Jessica, Mc Jessica McCreary is here. TH, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate that. What the hell just happened to our YouTube channel? Something happened there. I don't know what happened. Uh, hold on. Let me refresh that. See what? There it is. I just had to refresh. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Mike Walden. Good to have you here. Blix, good to see you. Thanks for coming on in. Uh, who am I missing? I got to race through here. Scotty Eisner, good to see you here. We're 30 seconds away. Nathan Allen, always a pleasure to have you here, my friend. Mike Walden again, thank you. Uh, where am I? I got screwed up here. Lord of Land, appreciate you coming on in. Hey, we got a lot of super chats happening, a lot of thumbs up. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We are literally about 130 away from 10,000. Hi, Tim and Spreaker. And here we go, everyone. Let's have a great night tonight, okay? We're on in five seconds. Butch, stand tight. We're almost here. Hi. British Columbia to you listening around the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on KPNL, Talk Stream Live, and Revolution Radio. If you want to take a listen to our archives, they are free for you by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out Bumblefoot, reading up on Captain Shirts SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Here we go with the final edition of Strange Days with Butch Witkowski of 2020. Which comes in near the end of each month to talk about the weird, the strange, and the wonderful career that he has investigating the paranormal realm. Butch is a creator and lead investigator for Pennsylvania's UFOCop.com. He is the director. He's an independent researcher since 1989 when he, with four other people, witnessed a UFO of unbelievable size quietly hovering above a mountain in Tucson, Arizona. It was totally silent. And tonight... We're going to get into some of the best stories that Butch has for this year of 2020. Then at the bottom of hour number three, I will bring you the SOR Newswire brought to you by Par Paranoia Magazine. Mr. Butch Witkowski, welcome back. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to you and all the best coming into the 2021 year for you, my friend. And uh, Same to you and all the SOAR members out there. Yes. Yes. Hard to believe. You know, this is... We're literally wrapping up our fifth year of you being on this show once a month, man. Five years already. It's scary. It's scary. <laughs> I know. I mean, you've almost died on us because you couldn't stand us. You've, uh, you know, you've you've sworn, you've cursed, you you've shaken your fist at us, and yet you're still here. I'm a glutton for punishment. I can tell. I can totally tell. I can totally tell, but my friend, you are one of the most special people that we have on this show, and, and you make us better. You make us better each and every time you are on the air, and we love you around here. Our audience loves you, but you do a lot for us. You don't even know what you're doing. You just come on and answer a bunch of questions for a couple of hours once a month, but uh, you mean a lot to us, and thank you for a wonderful 2020. You're quite welcome, sir, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs> Well, we appreciate that. We do appreciate that, absolutely. And, uh, of course, you know, 2020 coming to an end here. We're into the final week here, Butch. And I got to tell you, I, 
I'm happy to get this year over with, man. I really am. Man, that's two of us. I was watching my neighbor this afternoon. He was outside, and he was burning something on a little pile that he had of you know in his yard. I'm going like, you know, what are you burning? He said, my diary for 2020. Oh, said, my goodness. A good boy. <laughs> my goodness. Just right like that, eh? Yeah, he ended it. <laughs> he said, I don't want to remember anything this year. I went, oh, okay. You know, show-wise, though, I have to say this. Show-wise, 2020 has been a fantastic year for us. Our audience has grown huge ever since we not you know we added a few radio stations in in uh, Mississauga, Ontario, Saga Nine Sixty. We added uh, another one uh, in uh, Bellingham, Washington, and I got to tell you, it's it's been a good year for growth for us in a very depressed market, and we have been able to to uh, you know. With the addition of, of going live on YouTube, we've been able to to really try and, uh, you know, bring our show forward. And, and the people have responded, which is incredible, because I really thought putting my face on camera on YouTube would really cause a lot of people to go, oh, that's what that guy looks like? Yeah, we don't want any part of that. <laughs> oh, my God. The only thing you need is a pair of round blue sunglasses, and you got it nailed. Why? I wouldn't be able to see, man. <laughs> yeah, you would. Oh, barely, barely. But, no, it's good to have you here again, my friend. You know, looking back on 2020, how would you describe this year in regards to cryptid paranormal research considering the the restrictions we had? Um, I would have to describe the whole year as kind of weird, Um it started out with being extremely slow, and then then it just picked up. But then it was, you know, normally when it picks up, it's just it's either UFOs or something paranormal or something crypto. But it was just like all things combined all at once or combined reports where it was a UFO report and there was a crypto um, uh, add-on to it. And... Uh, then there was like these sporadic, a week off or maybe two weeks off, and then it picked right up again. And that's the way it's been all year. It has been that way all year. I've never gone over so many pictures and photographs since I've been doing this now for 30 years. And, I mean, some of them are very good. Most of them are crappy because it's a cell phone. You know how they are. They, how yes. they are. And, um, uh I would say out of if I had to split them all up into percentages, cryptos probably leads the pack, um, and that's everywhere. That's that's in Canada. That's in Mexico. That's in all the United States. It's everywhere, uh, overseas. And uh, there were some mutilation cases. They were mostly overseas. Uh, it was just a combination of everything. Usually, it's not usually the way it works. Usually, you know. You get hung up on UFO reports, and and you'll just get one after the other after the other after the other, and it'll just go on and on and on and on, and something will pop in, uh, you know, maybe a paranormal case or something else. But it really just gets crazy. Uh, that this year it was like it was everything, all the time, uh, with a few sporadic uh, two weeks off or you know maybe a week went by you didn't get much, but. It's just I, I don't know if it's a lot of people are home or they're out. You know, they just got to get out somewhere, so they're out in the woods, maybe locally, or they're uh, you know driving around somewhere, or they're watching the skies. And um, it's it's uh, been exciting. It's been interesting. Uh, got a lot of good cases. Uh, then you know, then there's the historical cases that have had some action. Um, uh, the Dietloff case, um, <laughs> the Russian investigators that when started their new investigation in 2019 uh, came up with they died of hypothermia. Yeah, sure okay, they did. whatever. Sure they did. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But nobody explains the injuries. It just it was hypothermia, and. Um, yeah, you know that was a little disheartening. But there are there's a Swedish team on the way up there. Uh, 
to do some do some stuff, do some testing. But even the older cases are being picked up again. You know, uh, some of the old older paranormal cases, uh, older crypto cases. But I'll tell you what, between um, Bigfoot, everything from Orang Pendek to Bigfoot. I mean, there's there's even people you know researching Gigantopithecus now. That creature has been dead for many, many years. But, uh, I mean, there's just a lot of people picking up on research because they don't have anything to do. They're, they're most likely, you know, if they're lucky, they have a job. But if they're not, they're sitting home playing on a computer, and they're doing their own research, and they're just, you know, picking up on things. And because and I've gotten a lot of emails on people saying, like, you know, I'm looking for this, that, and the other thing. Where do I go to get that? Or is there, you know uh, – some kind of database I can check on or, you know, something like that, which is, I was happy to help them. But it's, it's funny. I think, and I was just talking to Lon Strickler about this the other day. I think you're going to see a, not a big surge, but you're going to see a surge of more people uh, interested in the cryptozoology end of it and the UFO uh, end of it. Uh, Not so much paranormal. um, Although there's, a lot of shows on right now about paranormal, uh, so I, I'm not much on shows, but uh, the interest in ufology and the interest coming up in cryptozoology, especially Bigfoot, bipedal canines, uh, anything uh, rakes, anything running around the woods, uh, and and people are doing a real good job with it. I mean, you know, I've gotten some really good questions and, and some really good information from people, and um, it's amazing that a lot of these people that are that have gotten into this over this uh, year, last this period, this last year, have uh, don't live very far from a wooded area, or they're following up on old cases from their area, and that, that's pretty cool. I like that. I like to see people get engaged. Butch, this was pretty much the year of the UFO for about the third year in a row, but we all of a sudden saw yep. a real shift back into Sasquatch in popularity. You know, you've been around long enough to know that all of these topics are quite cyclical. But, uh, you know, in the ufology there, where we're all scrambling for some sort of government disclosure that'll never come, did we get any closer, do you believe? I think so. Uh, And and it might be in a small way, but I think we did. um, uh, Those outrageous stories that you used to hear about ufology in ufology and the outrageous stories that you used to hear in, in Bigfoot, they've pretty much gone away uh, you know, people are if you're getting involved uh they're 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 you know they're asking um serious questions or uh, you know whether it's the type of equipment they should be using or databases they should look at or books they should buy um and that it that's there's a big change there and it's like uh like I said, it's been exciting seeing the new people coming on. We've brought on some new members. Uh, the Fortean team has brought on some new members. Um, we're trying to get a Fortean team member in every state. I don't know how many we got covered now. I think it's 15 or 16. But uh, once that happens, then it'll be a lot better. And uh, working with teams is really neat because you don't ever have to sit here and s- struggle on your own. I mean, if you come up with an idea or or somebody gives you some information on trail uh, that they found or footprints that they found or hair or whatever, and they just need guidance what to do from that point on, there's so many people you can deal with right off the get-go. Like if, if I get a case in, in, uh, in Georgia or North Carolina, I have somebody there that I can contact. And that it's that's just the way it is. Um, I, I think it's, it, like I said, it's really been exciting, and I think it's going to carry on into 2021. We've been so focused on the science the last couple of years and, and the government knowledge in ufology, and I know I've asked you this before, but yeah. do you think, and I noticed this too near the last couple of months, but finally it seems the the experiencers are starting to come back out showing themselves that, you know, they're players in ufology, too. Correct. Yeah. And that they are. Uh, uh, there's been not a whole lot on my end, uh, but there have been, I've, I've noticed there have been uh, maybe half a dozen or so 
uh, just recently that just popped up and uh, in 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 uh, the the Pennsylvania area and New York area, New York State area, and I that's that was strange to me because you know that's kind of like a private thing with people. You know, they'll hook on with one researcher or investigator, and they'll stay with that till the end. And, and but now they're they're putting that information out, and they're looking for other people's input in what could have happened or what may have happened, or did did we ever have anything uh, like that? You know, in, in research that we've done, and uh, and and that's that's exciting, I think, because there's a lot of people out there that you know have an experience to share. And uh, like you said, they just started coming back. They were gone for quite a while. I mean, to find to find anybody talking about their experience or an abduction or anything like that was rare. And it's just like uh, I would say the last year and a half that those things are starting to pop up. But the stories seem more real. They don't seem yes. to be that far fetched anymore. <laughs> you know, uh, that's one thing that I have noticed, Butch. Yep. Yeah, the the there there. I mean, some of those stories years ago, uh, and not too distant years, were so outrageous. I mean, they, I, you could take the book off the shelf in your library and look at it, and they're reading off the book verbatim of what took place. Uh, now there's stuff that's uh, I've never read in any books. <laughs> they're just uh, uh, it's it's kind of weird because. You know, there's always that fortune and glory crowd, you know, and uh, they've kind of fallen silent, too. Um, uh, but then again, uh, one of the reasons they've fallen silent, all these conferences that were going on all year long have gone. They, they're not there anymore. Um, you know, people, first of all, don't have the money to go to them. Second of all, they, they you know, with all this uh, COVID stuff, they're not having them. They've been canceled. So all the all the big players in those genre, uh, you don't hear from them anymore. Now you're hearing from the um, the folks that would be asking those questions at a conference, and they don't have a conference to ask those questions at. So now they're they're searching out, you know, they're looking for people uh, on the net or uh, you know contact. And uh, it, it's it's really it, a lot has changed in the last year. A lot of it for the bad, but there's a lot of it for the good, and I'm just I'm just happy to see that uh, uh, there's a lot of questions being asked now, and people are following up. And you know, before if you talk to somebody, you know, you probably never heard from them again. Now, you know, it's like you know, my cell phone goes off or the home phone goes off, and you know, I've been talking with uh, a couple people now a couple times a week, and yeah, I'm guiding them through what they're doing, but. Again, they're doing it on their own. I'm not there. So you just give them what you can, give them the information they need, help them out where you can, and let them run with it. And who knows what they're going to find. I, I want to ask you. out there to find. I want to ask you, as we got about six minutes here before we hit the break at the bottom of the hour, regarding, you know, sticking with ufology for a second, but you heard the story about the Galactic Federation from the former head of security for Israeli Space Agency, Haim Shed, who said that there's this Galactic Federation that won't allow aliens to come down here. And we're going to talk about this with, with our Keith Andrews later this week. But but I'm I'm curious your reaction to that when you read that, because I think, you know, it really threw another wrench in this entire weirdness we call ufology. <laughs> yeah, it did. Well, so did to the Stars Academy. That was another throw a wrench in there. But uh, we'll see where it goes. I mean, a lot of people say a lot of things, uh, but you know they've got to kind of really, you know, put up or shut up. Um, you know, when they had all the stuff going to Washington, when they had the big crowd of all the researchers and investigators down in Washington D.C in front of all those old senators and stuff. You could tell that nobody believed the word they were saying because they was just talk. I mean, there was no proof. Uh, the Navy, you know, those photographs came out, those combat photographs, but uh, and now there's more stuff supposed to, supposedly coming out, I believe, in February, where uh, a pilot 
uh, on a military transport. It wasn't a fighter plane, but a military transport was doing some weather stuff, and um, he has some documented stuff. He is not in the service anymore. Uh, he's not under any stringent uh, keep your mouth shut type of deals. So he said he's going to publish this stuff. So looking forward to that. But you know, right here where I live, you know, I walked outside one night just a couple of weeks ago, and I looked up, and I'm looking at seven or eight orbs, you know, all over the place. Uh, and uh, you know, they're not in any type of formation, but they're zipping here and zipping there, and they get together, then they come apart, then they go up, then they go down, and then after about, I watched them for about ten minutes, and uh, it was a clear sky, and after that short time period they just like all went away at one time gone so what do you think that was well i think it was our space brethren of course but um there's so many ufo reports i mean they're all over the place i mean they're uh when i look at different databases where they might have had 10 15 around the country in a week yeah, 50, 60 reports in a week. Now, what that means, I have no idea. Uh, of course, you always have the, the, the certain individuals in the, in, in, in the UFO community that say, well, they're getting ready to come down and talk to us. I'm going, like, yeah, okay, whatever. But, um, and again, I think a lot of it has to do with people are home. They have nothing to do. So they're looking. They're researching. They're they're. They're doing whatever they have to do, and uh, they normally wouldn't do it before because they just really didn't have that kind of time. You know, they worked, this, that, and the other. Now they're home, and um, I hope they keep going. (laughs) I'm loving all the information. It's just great. Well, I mean, the shift in in ufology – you know, really has come off a lot of the researchers. And, you know, you mentioned to the Stars Academy, and I only want to talk about two minutes with this, as that's all we have till the break. What do you, what do you think happened there? I, that's, I don't know. I think a lot of that had to do with money. Again, fame and fortune. Um, the people that broke away say they're going to continue. The people that didn't break away that are still there say they're going to continue. So, you know, you don't know which way it's going to go. You know, whenever those things start up like that, it just, you know, right from the get-go, it's just bad, bad vibes. Um, you know, the hunt for Skinwalker Ranch, that was another one. Um, I mean, they did a lot of stuff, but they didn't do anything different than anybody else hasn't done over the years. And I guess they're off the air now. That's done. So... I don't know. I, I, I just uh, I, I put more faith in uh, the researchers that I know and people I've worked with for years and years and years and 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 just the way it is. I mean, but a lot of this stuff, like you know, like uh, another, I guess uh, uh, I just read somewhere Peter Robbins is going to have his own radio show now. Uh, and that's strange. <laughs> that's very strange. Who doesn't have a show? They hand out. They hand out shows like Oprah hands out prizes to her audience. Wow. You mean I'm going to get a car? You're going to get a car? You're going to get a car? You're going to get a car? Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. Uh, No, but, I mean, that's the reality of it right now. I mean, when in doubt, podcast. That's all you got to do. Yeah, well, and and a couple of the old timers have brought out a couple. uh, There's a couple new books coming out. But those are people that you never saw them in the field. They never saw a UFO. Um, so it's, it is what it is. Uh, anybody can write a book. Anybody. I don't care what they do. There's enough information out there that you can gather up and put your own word to it, and you'll have a book. Hey, and in the UFO field, you don't even have to do that. All you have to do is take down some experiencers' notes, glue it together, call yourself an author, and get paid on other people's experiences. How many times have we seen that in this field? Hey, Butch, hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Remember, five years ago, we lost Lemmy from Motorhead. Make sure you have a drink on Lemmy and for Lemmy. 
because we like our metal around here when we're not talking about this weird stuff on Spaced Out Radio with Butch Witkowski next. All right, we're clear. How much time we got there, boss? Five minutes. You got a chance to go uh, tinkle. That's exactly what I was going to do. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you, you got time. No worries. Oops. I got you covered. <clears throat> All right, boss. All right, uh, quick question here, Adam. Dave, the word squatch discredits all of the research done on this bipedal hominid. Why doesn't ancient aliens totally negate any research in the UFO field? I don't like ancient aliens. I think they're, uh, I think, uh, you know, I don't like it. I don't believe their research. That's just me. Not a fan. Not a fan at all. Uh, Cat Chaser. Dave, tell us about your four nights off. Well, <clears throat> on Christmas Eve, I, uh, well, we did the sh- No, we didn't do the show. Um, I literally wrapped presents and, uh, uh, exercised my right as Santa Claus to, to share the cookies with my dogs. Let's see here. Hey, Duke, how you doing? On Saturday, uh, woke up, opened presents with the fam. And had a good turkey dinner with a couple of friends coming over that night. And, uh, oh, and, uh, what did I do that night? Nothing. Nothing. And I slept. And then I woke up on Boxing Day, the 26th, at about 11 in the morning. And I was going to go out and do the, some snow blowing. In my driveway, and then my pajamas just said, no, we're way too comfortable. So that's what I stayed in. And I was up until, uh, uh, that was Saturday, I had to do the website and my blog. <clears throat> so I got to bed about 2 o'clock in the morning. After going into my studio about, I don't know, 10 o'clock. And from there, yesterday, stayed in my pajamas all day, did nothing. And today, uh, I did, uh, what did I do today? I did the thought of the Dave. I ate dinner. I ran to town. Um, that's about it. I showered. That's about it. Hey, Butch, how you doing, man? I'm good, sir. I'm good. Absolutely. Hey, Trust, welcome back to the show. Hello, Neil Jones. I'm quite certain that there's another world invisible, mostly within our own world, which at various times in any place. You know what? You may be right on that, man. You may be right on that. Hey, Spudgerino, how you doing? Good to have you here. Uh, I have a German Shepherd and a German Shepherd Cross. Uh, but they're both older. They're slowing down, and but they still enjoy the snow like puppies. We got about uh, two minutes here, Butch. Got it. Uh, Nucker, I got a signed Gordie Howe puck for Christmas. I have uh, uh, a couple Gordie Howe signed books. Yes. Hard to believe, five years ago, Lemmy Kilmister died. Wow. All right. Matthew Brown, how you doing? Oh, Butch is playing in the chat room now. He'll be signing autographs after the show, people. He will. <laughs> he will. Uh, you got a lot of good people on there, buddy. We do. We do. Which, by the way, I should give a shout-out to Swamp Monkey, TH, Lori, 
Cuban Carl and Cat Chaser for the amazing super chats tonight. Thank you for doing that. I really do appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, it works good. Hey, Iberata in Singapore, how are you? What did he, he got a new Mini Mac, uh, or Mac Mini, and it times two 27-inch 4K monitors. Beautiful, man, beautiful. That's awesome. All right, 15 seconds. Uh, we're still 130 away from 10,000 subscribers on our channel. That is my New Year's wish now. Uh, so if you haven't hit subscribe, please hit subscribe. Give us a thumbs up or down as well. Here we go with Butch in five seconds. Second half hour of Space Now Radio is underway. Here we go with Butch with Coast. Great stage tonight. Before we bring Butch on, I want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with Butch Witkowski. Strange days. It's the final appearance of 2020 for Butch, and we're always glad to have you here, my friend. Thank you for joining us. Oh, absolutely. Trying to make a push. See if before the end of the year, Butch, that we can hit 10,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel. That was my goal. I'm 130 shy right now. 130 shy. Oh, you'll make it. You'll make it. I hope so. We're coming down to the deadlines here. You know? Like, you know what? With my luck of 2020, I'm going to end at like 9,997 or something like that. (laughs) Well, 9,999 would be even worse. True. 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 Actually, no, because I would totally make a fake account and make that happen right there. I would totally do that. I would have no problem doing that. If I'm that close, I'm going to cheat. You know, that way I could give away a T-shirt and stuff. But, you know, at 9,997, you can't cheat because then you got to create three new emails, and then it just looks bad. It just looks bad. <laughs> it's tainted at that point. But, no, seriously, <laughs> though. Seriously, though, if, you, if you're listening to this show and you've checked out our archives and you haven't had the opportunity to hit that subscribe button yet on YouTube, just go to YouTube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I do appreciate that. And, uh, yeah, moving on here. 2020, of course, was a very tough year because of the lockdowns. And it, hard to get to places, Butch. Hard to get to yeah. places. And, you know, how did this change your way of investigation on these topics while being locked down? Well, a lot of it had to be done, you know, on the computer, by phone, a couple in person, but mostly by phone and Internet, emails, uh, snail mail. It it, it was a a real pain in the butt, but it got – I got used to it after a while, and we're still on lockdown here in my county. Um, but it is what it is. I mean, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, it's not like I can just tell everybody to, you know, let's pack up and go, uh, because <laughs> there's a lot of places that aren't uh, accessible. You just can't get to them. Uh, They're either in lockdown or they're closed. Like a lot of the state parks are closed. And um, uh, we have a a goodly amount of expedition scheduled as soon as it, you know, turns in our favor. But uh, but then we've, you know, last week and the week before we had really terrible cold. And we had a good snow, 12 inches, so. Uh, that's gone by now because now the temperature today was like 45. So it, it's it's just been a weird year. 
uh, for investigation and research. Uh, I tried to catch up on, um, you know, some of the shows, the newer shows that were on. Uh, nothing really, you know, pressed my button, but uh, then I, I just started looking into the older cases and, and you know, getting files straight and documenting things that I've been promising myself to get done and uh, got that all finished up, uh, looked into some older cases. Um, the one that was really uh, bugging me for a long time and I just couldn't get anybody and I finally did get somebody was the uh, mutilations of horses over in France. And uh, uh, it seemed to like that quieted down now, uh, probably in the last two weeks. What but, was, ha- what know, was like, happening there? Oh, they were being mutilated. Uh, horses uh, in France, which is just odd because France never, ever, ever has anything like that. Uh, and um, they were being mutilated just like cattle. And uh, there were like uh, the last count, I think it was 34. And... At first, they thought it was just, you know, a bunch of clowns running around doing it. But, again, it was the same the same thing. No blood, you know, the same parts missing. And uh, it's really, it's just weird. Uh, but it seemed to settle down now because I did talk to, I did get all the researcher over, the, over there. And, um, hey, he said, hey, we haven't had anything. We're still looking. But I'll tell you one thing they did that, was never done here where, you know, here you would get look, somebody reported to a sheriff, you know, a farmer would report to a sheriff and the sheriff would go out and that'd be the end of it or a, or a veterinarian. Uh, over there, they had people armed going to all these farms, watching the farms and stuff. And that could have been a, a reason why it slowed down too. But it just, again, it was like the same, same deal we have here with uh, cattle. And I've only ever had one horse mutilation here. That was in South Dakota, and um, it's, uh, you know, we had cats at one time over in England that were being cut in half. Uh, That kind of went by the wayside, too. So just like these things hit sporadically. Now, the cats, I'm I'm assuming, was just a bunch of nitwits. But but the horses, I mean, horses are a big animal. I mean, well, it's sort of cattle, but it just seemed like... um, for that to happen in France, it was just so odd to me because, like I said, getting a UFO report out of France is like pulling teeth. I mean, there's they just don't have them or they just don't share them. But cattle mutilation, boy, they shared that big time. And then, you know, I looked into the uh, um, the school teacher down there in, in North Carolina that was uh, kind of butchered. They still don't know what killed her. They have no idea, none whatsoever. They've done DNA on everything, including the grass that she laid on. And, they're, I mean, there's just they have no idea what got to her. What do you think it was? Uh, what do you think? I, I, you know what? I, I just don't know because, first of all, out of all the DNA testing, they found no uh, – her dogs <laughs> were like 25 feet away from her just sitting there. They weren't hurt. Um. There was no DNA, dog DNA or canine DNA or uh, odd DNA, uh, you know, like you know, mountain lion or whatever. I mean, it just wasn't anything different. But to be shredded, like I mean, she was just ripped apart. Now, of course, there's you got one investigator in that area who, who truly believes that it was a uh, you know a Wendigo. Um, but there's no signs that, you know, Wendigos are noted for eating people once, once they kill them. But um, they didn't see anything where she was gnawed on by anything. She was just shredded. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, she was an older woman, but it, it, they have nothing. Uh, I talked to one sheriff deputy down there, and he said, we still don't have anything. And they brought everybody in. They had the FBI in uh, the North Carolina uh, investigation of uh, people out of the out of, um, the Capitol. I mean, they had everybody there, and they just can't come up with anything, anything at all. And that's very odd. I mean, they don't have the, they don't have any bears. They don't have any predators in that in that particular area. But if you go from where she was found and just go 30 miles north east of where she was found 
is where the little boy was found that claimed that uh, a teddy bear took care of him in that cold night while he was out there dressed in just plain clothes. Nothing, no winter clothes or anything like that. You remember that case? I do. I do. That was one of the stranger cases of this year. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, uh, you can draw a direct line from where she was. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure it was like 30 or 31 miles to the spot where she was found. Uh, so are the two connected? Eh, who knows? Now And then, of course, you have people that say Bigfoot, but there was no tracks or anything like that. I mean, they, they scoured the area. They took all kinds of samples of the ground, um, uh, everything. I mean, they did DNA studies of the creek uh, near where she was. Uh, they did the same thing with the boy. I mean, they, they took all kinds of samples from the tree and the brush and all that stuff where he was hiding or where this hit the teddy bear took care of him. And uh, I've ruled out a bear a long time ago because a bear – Wintertime, hungry, that kid would have been lunch in a minute. Uh, so, again, that takes you down to, like, what exactly would look like a teddy bear to a kid that age, five years old, and take care of it? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I always thought that was Sasquatch. That seemed like a, a, a complete Sasquatch case for me with the little guy. Pretty, pretty much every investigator that I've talked to, and only three were involved in that case down in that area, but there are people around that area, and our people, everybody came up with the same thing you just said. I think that the community is pretty united in that one, and the fact that the boy, you know, had eyewitness statement or testimony. Has anybody, Butch, FOIA requested the report of what happened there? Do you know of? No, no. Uh-uh. Not that I'm aware of, no. Do you think that would be something that could get released? Well, I guess you could uh, do a Freedom of Information Act and get the reports. I'll have to call, I'll have to call one of those guys down there and see if anybody did that. Maybe they did it already, I don't know. Because I, I, mean, I would, I would love getting, to see that. The only information that I was getting was directly from those guys. So, uh, I mean, I didn't, you know, put my nose into it, but uh, it's just awful strange. It's just awful strange. Uh, first of all, the weather, uh, you know, the bear out of that. I just took that right out because, like I said, if it was a bear, the kid would have been lunch. And then again, bears are hibernating that hibernating that time of time of year, so they're not out. Um, and he just said, you know, the kid just said it was a big teddy bear, and he wasn't hurt. He had no frostbite or anything like that. He had no um, no damage, no cuts, bruises, or anything else. I mean, his body temperature was not quite normal, but damn close to it. So. Something kept kept him warm, and he was gone for two days. What, night, uh, I think it was like night. Was it twenty nine hours? Nineteen twenty nine hours, I think it was altogether. So he wasn't malnourished. Uh, anything like I mean, and they took him to the hospital. He was like, he was fine. Yeah, the only scratches he had on him seemed to come from that briar patch that he was stuck in. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, as far as damage done by anything other than other than the sticker bush, nothing. Nope. One of those mysteries. You know, that's the kind of case where I hope in about 15, 18 years, when that boy grows up and is able to maybe rethink what happened, you know, yeah. because that's a memory the child should hopefully have. All right. I, I really yeah. hope he comes out and says what really happened to him. I really do. There's a major story there. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was just absolutely, totally weird. Um, And then now the Australian case where the boy was chasing his sister around the house playing, that was was in the middle of the summertime. And um, he made around the house, and she was chasing him, and he made another around the house, and she was chasing him, she made another around the house, and he was gone. 
They never found him. Yeah. I mean, the neighbor's sign playing in the yard with his sister. He was running past the window where his uh, mother and grand grandmother were, you know, right at the window watching him. And he went around the house, and that's it. He's gone. Never found him or anything of him. It'd be interesting. You know, I mean, that's right out of what David Politis does and what, what you do in, in, in looking for these strange cases that are out yeah. there. You know, I still think, and I know we've talked about it ad nauseum here, but I still think every time we hear of one of these cases, I think that person has gone into a different portal. I really do. Well, I mean, six, seven years ago, if you would have mentioned portal, people would have thought you were loony. That's gone by the wayside. Now people are really giving that consideration. Uh, there are even some scientists that are looking in uh, to o- how they could open up a black hole, and they say they can do it. Now, not to any great extent like you'd see out in the universe somewhere, but um, they, they think they can create a black hole. That, and then just like the one researcher said, he said if there's a black hole, he said there's, there's, there's got to be another dimension. And, of course, with all the missing people <laughs> that I've looked at, over all these years, I mean, it's they got to be going somewhere. I mean, you know, there's nothing's ever found of them. I mean, they just vanish off the face of the earth. That's it. They're gone. And then you have military stuff, stuff in the military that happened. Uh, the pilots that landed in the desert, uh, you know, and, and they, the rescue team gets there. The plane's fine. Plenty of fuel starts right up, and they can see the, the footsteps walking away side by side off into the desert uh, and they just stop. That's the end of them. They've never been found either. Just too many things. I mean, you have whole villages that disappeared over time. Don't know. Just so many things out there that you want to know, but, you know, it's like beating a wall. I mean, there's just, you can't get any further than what you got. I mean, that's it. And you know, you try to pull all the angles together. This could have happened. That could have happened. Um, you know, so you get left with a headache and looking kind of dumb because you can't figure it out. Oh, I hear you. We've all been there. We've all been there. But, you know, a lot of these cases that we are seeing of these missing people, some of them show back up. Some of them do not. Some of them... Uh, are are gone forever you know it, it's easy to throw out the aliens cryptids portals type of conjecture without any proof or knowledge of it however you know the simple answer is did somebody watching these children come up and kidnap them you know i mean it it just seems a lot more logical well yeah th- that would be the easy answer but in the case with the kid in Australia that was running around the house, the neighbor was watching him. Mom and grando and grandmother were watching him. The 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 sister was watching him. She he was right behind her. Uh, she turned the corner and ran past the window, and he didn't turn the corner. Now down the street or the next house down from where they were at the grandmother's house, the guy's cutting the lawn. And he's watching him. He didn't see anything. Uh, there's no houses on the other side of the street. Uh, it's a, It borders, well, we would call it a state park. Uh, they, just, they just say it's a wild area. Uh, but it's like, you know, investigators chalk that right off because there's a certain type of a bush. Um, I don't remember the name of it. But if you get scratched, you can really get really nasty, uh, sick from it. And they surround that whole uh, park area and they're they're like six foot off the ground and there's no way that he could have got through there and um, you know in that whole area of 50 miles there's only one um, uh, pedophile that they knew of and he was at work so uh, wasn't him the people that lived on that block or that road said nobody went up and down the road in a vehicle 
So it's just another one of those cases where, you know, everything that you think could have happened didn't happen. And then when you have witnesses, it's, uh, I don't see anything. You know, nobody went up the road, nobody came down the road. And, you know, there's a guy cutting his grass, and he's, no, he's like 50 yards away. He didn't see anything. So, like you said, did he run around the corner and run into a portal? Could be. What's the chances? What's the chance? Yeah, what's the chances of that actually happening, though? Well, I have to go back to Sasquatch. Look how many people have seen Sasquatch, and he vanishes. Or there's a flash of light, and he vanishes. Or there's a flash of light, and he appears. You know, where's he going? That, that light flashing just makes me crazy because up until about six, seven years ago, you never heard anything like that. And then it was, um, and it was good researchers that were out there that were reporting that stuff where, you know, they, were, they, they saw something, they were setting up the camera, and they still had it in sight, and then there was a flash of light, and it was like it was never there. It was just gone. Hard to believe. It really is. And and trust me, dude, I want to believe. This is something that oh. that I do believe there is something a little bit nefarious happening at this point. But but I mean it's so out of reality to watching all of these people vanish. Not just that child running around the house. There was also a case of that exact same thing happening in Winnipeg or just outside of Winnipeg, Manitoba a few years ago, where a child two year old child was running around his house and just vanished, and they were out in a farm area where you can see for miles on gravel roads when people are driving up. Just vanished. Never to be seen again. Oh, man, I'll tell you. Uh, it's, I mean, there are so many weird things that have happened. and I, I mean, and not that they weren't witnessed. I mean, there were a lot of stuff that were witnessed. I mean, you know, uh, the one that always always tripped my trigger was the, the young group that uh, was at a bar and the bar closed up and everybody's out front of the bar and Joe goes to get his car and that's the end of Joe. <laughs> I mean, he, he's just gone. Keys are laying on the ground and he's gone. Never found him. Never seen anything. Never heard anything. There was no sign of a scuffle or anything like that. They watched him walk toward the car. They actually saw him go toward the car. And when he walked around to the side, they figured, you know, he opened the door, but then they didn't come. They thought, well, maybe he tripped and fell, and, you know, they ran over there, and he was gone. They'd never been found either. Well, that brings up portals to me once again. Yeah. You know, if, if we only had a way – well, I mean, there have been some advances. You know, we, we need to put that out there. There have been some advances in the way we do investigations. Like, we're going to start using environmental DNA. And, uh, I mean, you know, we can take samples from streams uh, in an area where there's been uh, reports of a cryptid of any type. And, you know, whether it's upstream or downstream, it doesn't matter. The water, it, it'll carry, and you'll get the DNA. Uh, that, and, um, and now uh, uh, there's another um, thing coming online now. It's a, uh, a portable scanner that um, you can scan a footprint. You don't have to do the plaster and all that stuff. And it will give you the depth and the width and the thickness and the weight and all this stuff. So, I mean, there are, there are things being developed. But just like I said to one of my guys the other week, I said, look, if, if there wasn't anything out there, these people wouldn't be investing all this kind of money to develop these things just to, you know, check to see if there's any goldfish in the stream. Very true. They're looking for something. They're looking for something. The same thing with the scanners. I mean, they're looking. I mean, th th there's a reason for it. Butch, and, hold, uh, hold it right there. Hold it right there because we do have to go to break here at the top of the hour, and I don't want to miss anything if you have to start going into some pretty awesome detail, which you normally do. So I'm going to get you to hold on. Butch Witkowski, Strange Days. It's the final appearance of Super Butch here before we say goodbye to 2020 and hello, Butch, in 2021. 
Yes, UFOcop.com is his website. Make sure you check it on out. More Strange Days with Bush Wachowski at Hour 2. All right, bud, we got uh, six minutes. I'll be right back, okay? Okay.
I do that every now and again. Come back. We've got about 90 seconds. Hey, Mark Ellens. Welcome. Kevin, welcome for uh, the welcome to the show. Merci beaucoup, poulet de bleu. Zenzibil, good to have you here, man. Oh, I'm back. I am back. Hey, a big thank you uh, to Adam, Swamp Monkey, TH, Lori, Carl, and Cat Chaser for the awesome super chats. Thank you for everyone who's given us a thumbs up or down tonight. Really do appreciate it. And uh, we're going to start the show here in about 30 seconds. So uh, just stay tuned. We're, we got it covered. My neck is killing me, but that's okay. Hopefully my chiropractor. How did the leg ever heal? What's that, Butch? How did the leg ever heal? Oh, fine. Fine. Hold on. One sec. Here we go. Hour number two of Space Down Radio is now underway. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate it. My name is Dave Scott. Hanging out with all of you, there's no place I would rather be on this night. We want to welcome back everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, KPNL, and Revolution Radio. Remember, you can check out all of our archives for free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me to do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Yester Tempest. Yester Tempest is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as a clam. Sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on with Strange Days of Butch Witkowski, the final appearance of Butch here of 2020. Butch, welcome back. Yes, sir. Almost got excited and said 2021 there for a second. Yeah, it sounded that way. <laughs> yeah, couldn't remember the year. Yeah, but we're, we got you back nonetheless. Uh, Butch, bipedal canines, this has been your forte the last couple of years here on Spaced Out Radio. And yes. every time you come on in and tell us a story about these creepy cryptid creatures, it just freaks me on out, man, to think that there's a 7 to 10 foot tall dog looking like creature that is just angry at life <laughs> yeah how many cases how many cases have you done on this creature in 2020 uh we've gotten 59 so far 59 yeah no, it's just in the state of pennsylvania and uh with the exception of three they are with all within our research uh area that we call the lichen loop um, which is 180 miles one way and 79 miles the other way. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're strange. Out of those 59 sightings and, and reports that you have taken, what's the similarities in between them all that you have noticed? None. There has been no similarities in the reports. I can take the first report, that we got the very first one and pull it up and pull up the one, the last one we got. And, uh, of uh, the description of the, of the bipedal is exactly the same. It's no different. Really? So, yep. They're all the same. There's, I mean, color, size, shape, uh, head, uh, everything glowing yellow eyes. Everything is exactly the same. There's no difference. That's, I, we saw that, um, we really didn't get to that point till I think we were in our seventh report, maybe sixth or seventh report, that it finally smacked me in the back of the head that, look, you know, 
these people are all seeing the same thing, and they ain't even close to each other. You know, one guy's up here, the other guy's, you know, like 100 miles away, and this one's over here is like 80 miles from there, and, you know, they're, they're describing exactly the same creature. And at that point, we were not documenting anything on the Internet on the reports other than kind of a half-butt type of description, you know, no location or anything like that. And, um, you know, in our background research and historical research is where we found these things have been around for a long, long time. Uh, the one that still amazes me is, like, I, I, you know, I was just going back as far as I could, and I, I got to a newspaper clipping in, um, uh, I forget it was called, Erie New Era or something like that newspaper, from 1868. And it was a farmer took a shot at one, and then he goes into town to the local constable, and he describes exactly, exactly, right to the T, what we've been getting reports on. One thing that we have come up with is that in a number of these areas uh, where the sightings were, there are uh, caves. So... I mean, that's one of our first uh, four expeditions to caves as soon as we get out and get about. But, um, you know, they, they are what they are. I mean, it's not like um, 59 people, well, more than that, because some of them were multi-witnessed and some of them were law enforcement. So, you know, it's not like all these people got together and made up this great story. But... Um, it's it's wild. It, it's that something has been around that long. Now, talking to indigenous uh, uh, folks with their history, I mean, they say that they are watchers. They're they're protectors. Um, some people say, you know, they're they're wind, the windigo. Well, they're not the windigo because they don't they don't they wouldn't be the same every time. The size. The, um, we have no prints, but we have impressions, and they're lar very large. I mean, you know, I, I guess the part that bothers me the most is if I would get one, the only one that we got that was kind of out of the norm as far as the sightings went, it was, it was within the first 10 reports that we got. And uh, a couple of guys coming home from work, and they, they come up on this thing that was eating a roadkill. And when it stood up, and they had to drive past it when it stood up, it had a glow around it, like a silverish glow. Now, like the guy said, it could have been his high beams when he hit them, you know, reflecting off the hair of the creature. Uh, but he said it didn't look that. It looked very uniform. And um, that that was the only oddball. But... Um, you know, people say, well, they can go in, they can go out, they can do it. Well, if that's the case, why are they eating a roadkill? Why do they have to eat? Right? Well, if they're hungry, why wouldn't they eat? Yeah, but I mean, if they're interdimensional, why would they need to eat? They wouldn't need to sleep. They wouldn't need to do anything. And another thing, the ones that, that were caught running... They're hellacious fast. I mean, we talked to an old fellow, uh, an older gentleman, who walks his dogs. And he's right down from where we had our very first two sightings. He lives in that area, <clears throat> and he described he, not not as good a description as we wanted, but he said he sees this very large man who looks like he's wearing a fur coat running through the woods at the top of a hill. He's at the, on the road with the dogs, but there's a hill, a little field and a hill that goes up into the woods, and he can see him running along the woods. He said he's seen him twice so far. And, uh, you know, his description was, I think he was wearing a fur coat, but he was he was tall. He was really tall, muscular. Well, <laughs> that's exactly what we're looking for. So we'll be making another couple trips back in that area. But it, it's... You know, when you get into these areas looking for these things, I mean, the whole forest goes quiet. I mean, it's just nothing. I mean, we're in 16,000 square, mile, uh, uh, square miles of 
uh, three game lands at me, and the, there's all kind of, I mean, they got koi wolves, they got bear, they got everything that flies, crawls, walks, or whatever, and we don't hear a sound, not one sound, not a peep, not a chirp, nothing. And that was on a full moon weekend. So that's kind of spooky. I got to ask you, in, in regards to the 59 encounters that people had, how close were they? How far away were they? Was each case different? Um, yeah, I, w- I would say that, yes. Uh, you have um, one gentleman uh, that was um, uh, out hunting birds uh, near a swamp area, and he walked up on one. So I said, well, how far away were you? He said, 10 feet. I said, then what happened? He said, uh, he said I was going to shoot. And then, and here's another thing. They, the ones that did have the encounters that were close, where it walked out on them or it was following them through the woods or whatever, all had the same thing. Whether they were armed or not, like, don't do anything dumb, you know. Like, the one guy had one in his rifle scope. He said, I could have took him out in a heartbeat. He said, but I couldn't pull the trigger. It's just something like they get this thing in their head where you pull that trigger and things are going to get really bad really quick and um he stayed up in that tree for like four hours till it went away and then he got down and got in his truck and they went down to the local game station and they said oh yeah it's a big dog we've seen him running around here they ain't no dog first of all they've never been seen on all fours ever now dog men different story they're seen on all fours they don't look alike they're not as tall um they're not as muscular they have tails <clears throat> Excuse me. They have tails. Uh, sometimes they're said they have glowing red eyes. Um, they're multicolored. Uh, these are not multicolored. These are uh, extremely dark brown or black. Um, like I said, they've been seen by law enforcement. Um, it's, it's just it's it's just weird that somebody said to me one time. They said, "Well, do you think it's just one?" Well. Yeah, I guess it could be just one, you know, in a certain area. But when you look at the uh, history of the ground of, of that area, of that in that lichen loop, it's nothing. I mean, it's loaded with Indian burial grounds all over the place. And um, at, at you know, at one point Pennsylvania had no white men in it; it was all indigenous. So you had these huge tribes, you know, like seven or eight different tribes living in Pennsylvania, especially in that area. And um, and they were all at war with each other, so there's burial mounds everywhere, and it kind of leads me to you know what the indigenous out in Oklahoma told me that you know they could be watchers. Um, they ruled out uh, Wendigos. Uh, they said you know they're there to protect the grave sites. Uh, we couldn't find any reports as far back as we went, even outside the loop. In, in back in time in Pennsylvania where anybody was ever hurt or injured. Um, they just kind of walk out on you, like you're in the woods and you're walking along a trail and they'll walk out in front of you or behind you. And they just kind of just stare you down. And we only had one report, and that was three couples that were on a, the, the, where they live is like a cul-de-sac and then there's a, a walking trail behind this cul-de-sac so that you know, they just every now and then go for a walk the, the three couples and they went around the first turn and this thing walked out of the woods and just stood there and the lady freaked out I mean the one lady I mean she went eight and um, it growled snarled and started walking to walking toward them showing aggression and they just hightailed it out of there that's the only report of any aggression shown, with the exception of the guy in the tree, the hunter, where when he when it first walked up to the tree, it must have caught him downwind because it got below him and looked right up, and it didn't growl. It just kind of like a low murmuring snarl and showed some teeth. And he just, I said to him, I said, what were you thinking? He said, I couldn't tell you what I was thinking. He said, but he said when it was walking up toward him, 
you know, he put the scope on him and 30 out six rifle. And he said, he said, I could have dropped him in a heartbeat. He said, I just couldn't do it. He said, I just could not do it. Interesting. So what they are and why they're there, uh, I have no idea. I don't have a clue. But they've been there for a long, long time, long time. And like, you know, with Bigfoot in Pennsylvania, there have been Bigfoot sightings where you have um, a sighting of a UFO at the same time. I mean, that's that's something that um, uh, is more tend to happen out in western Pennsylvania, uh, where shots are fired and you know all that kind of stuff. But uh, it's strange uh, in that you know bipedal. It just watches you. I mean, it's it's. We haven't had anything, with the exception of the screaming lady, which probably scared it more than it scared her. Uh, and you would think, after all these years, and I can only go back to 1868 with that first report that was printed, and you know, come in the present time, that you know, we've had people sitting in cars. Uh, we had a couple sitting in cars, uh, and they were at a local cemetery, and the mother got out to go put flowers on a grave of uh, a family member. And the, the daughter, a young girl, seven, I think she's 17 years old, she was sitting there, and the car started shaking, and she turned around and looked, and there was one looking at the in the back window. Then she said it came to the side and tried to open up the door. And... They sent us pictures, and we know we knew these people really well because the one lady is a she's a researcher, but more paranormal, and sent us a picture of the scratches on the car, and they were big and deep and wide. So what's out there? We're not going to know until we come across one, and we're going to do, you know, whatever we got to do to get it. I mean, to get it on on in thermal imaging or whatever we got to do, we're going to do. And I, I still think that, you know, we have all these abandoned mines, towns, caves all over this state, and especially in the Lycan Loop. There must be 30 uh, abandoned towns, houses, um, factories, uh, caves, etc. cetera. And, and, you know, I just think that they're not walking around in the woods all day long and all night long, and, and all these places where they're seen – are all within state parks. I mean, we don't have any reports of them, not the local 7-Eleven getting up Slurpee. Um, they're not digging through trash cans or anything like that. They stay within that loop, and they stay inside of the state parks on game lands, which makes sense because, you know, if they got to eat, there's everything they need there to eat. There's water so and shelter. We'll see. Either we'll get it or it'll get us. <laughs> Let's go to a couple questions here from our chat rooms. And sure. Tammy is asking, what reason do you think there are so many more sightings of such a variety of creatures the last few years? Uh, well, I'm going to say that I would probably say that 50% of those are valid sightings and the other 50% are probably misidentification. You know, you get somebody that lived or grew up in the city, the big city, you know, New York or Pittsburgh or whatever, and, you know, they're out in the woods for the first time in their life, and they see something big and tall and brown run across the road or through the woods. Well, to them, they just saw Bigfoot. I mean, it could have been a bear. It could have been a deer. So um, some of this stuff is a little on the ridiculous side. Like uh, one guy was pushing not too long ago, maybe three or four months back, he was pushing the Jersey Devil was now in Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, he said I had the look of a, had the head of a horse and had wings and all this stuff and this, that, and the other thing. And uh, <laughs> a researcher from another group who happened to live like within five miles of the sighting said, uh, yeah, that's Larry riding his horse through the woods. <laughs> I went like, does Larry have wings? He went, no. So, you know, people see stuff on TV, and they go out in the woods. They, they have no knowledge of the woods. 
you know, if I'd send them up to your area, they'd probably be dead within a week or less. Mm-hmm. Uh, if if I take them with us when we go into the, the you know the deep dark regions, um, we probably never see them again. So it's I, when people start telling me the way the creature acted, the way it looked, then I know they saw something. And you know when they give me the description and the location, everything like that, you know, and I might have another sighting or another report, maybe just a few miles down the road from where they saw this. And um, we finally, after all this time, have uh, a couple of law enforcement officers that work in those areas that are helping us out, which is great. Uh, before before that, you know, I could I could go in there and throw cash on the table, and they'd look at me and go like, "That's a bribe." <laughs> but you know, we got a sighting of a rake. Uh, but we can't get in there because the park's closed and it's multi-witness sighting. Now, what they're seeing, I have no idea, but what they're describing is a rake. Now, do I believe in rakes? Not a chance. I'd have to come upon one and look at it face to face before I figure that one out. But now over in Europe, rakes are pretty common. They're as common over there as Bigfoot is out in the Northwest. Follow up from Tammy. What creatures do you think are real then? Bigfoot, Dogman, but what else? Uh, I would have to say uh, Mountain Lion, which is not supposed to exist here in Pennsylvania. Bigfoot, Bipedal Canine, uh, I'm not too sure about the rakes yet. I I still think that's an old wives' tale that just got cranked up. Um, large birds, but again, they're just they're just reports. There's no photographs. There's no really good information other than you know somebody saw something fly above the trees. Well, most people couldn't tell you if a plane was a thousand feet off the ground or ten thousand feet off the ground. But uh, Bigfoot, bipedal canines, yeah, there, there, there's something out there. I mean, I, I just can't believe that with all the, all the prints that have been taken over time, that there's some clown walking around out there with Bigfoot strapped to his feet and walking around stomping here and there. Yeah, especially, you know, like up in your area. I mean, there's there's great great photographs of stuff up in there, but you know, until we have proof, DNA or a body, it's just an investigation. You know, it's just research. I mean, there's so many. I mean, look at the look at all the expeditions that have gone over to Nepal. You know, looking for a Yeti. I mean. Those, that's expensive stuff there. I mean, these guys are carrying, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment, and they're not getting any more than we are. Very true. Now, you know, when you have a person that is face-to-face with something, whether it's a Bigfoot or a cryptid, I mean, you can tell just the way they're talking to you that it's not a story, it's not BS. This happened, they saw it. This is what they saw, and that's it, done. And you you can't, you just can't go out there and say that everybody you've talked to is a liar, you know, or, or they're making up a story they want a television program or something like that. That just doesn't happen. And on that note, but, Butch, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Butch Witkowski's Strange Days final appearance of Butch here on Space Out Radio in 2020 his website ufocop.com will continue the strange monster talk with big bad butch right after this on spaced out radio all right buddy we're clear okay
Oh, look at that. Butch Witkowski, Josh Gates is a real deal. Look at that. Yeah. <coughs> knows what he's doing, knows how to do it. Well, I'd like to know what their show budget is. Wouldn't that be nice? Mm. That'd be crazy. Oh. Night's flying by. As for always. Uh, what, what is this here? Meanwhile, at a convenience store somewhere in rural Pennsylvania, Mr. Witkowski has a most unusual experience. Dave, you won't believe me, but, and it's you standing beside a dog man and a Bigfoot getting ready to pay. What? Oh, uh, Dirty Filth is his new uh, painting and portrait of you. Really? Oh, yeah. This is awesome. Wow. I got a nice one from him. Hold on. Hold on. You remember last last time you were on, uh, we you mentioned the comment that you had socks you had socks older than me. Butch, you remember that? I can barely hear you. Do you remember last time when you were on, you mentioned that you had socks older than me? Shit. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got that, yeah. Okay. Did he send you one of the paintings on that? No. Oh, fuck, he sent me one. It was hilarious. I, I think I got it upstairs. I've got a bunch of these from Phil. Uh, We've got about uh, two and a half minutes, Butch. Or two minutes, okay. pardon me. Okay. All right, 90 seconds. Uh, surf chair, camp, uh, send it to uh, Dave at spacedoutradio.com. I think Sukvinder is listening to us from the United Kingdom, I believe. And we have uh, Chris GP. Welcome. Welcome, man. Uh -huh. I think we're all caught up. Uh, thank you once again to Cat Chaser Times 2, Adam, Swamp Monkey, TH, Lori, Human Carl for the Super Chats tonight. You guys are all amazing. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And, uh, oh, he's from Coventry, UK. Wonderful. Thank you, Sukvinder. I appreciate you. Appreciate you. Sherry, thank you for joining us. Vinster, good to have you here. Uh, we've got about 20 seconds left. Thank you to everybody who's given us a thumbs up and thumbs down. We really do appreciate the love and support around here. And, uh, yeah, we've got about 10 seconds before we'll bring Super Butch back on. He's wearing his cape tonight, so it's always good. So here we go. <laughs> We passed the halfway. 
Waypoint of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We do appreciate it, including you, Savinder, all the way in Coventry, UK. Thank you for tuning us on in. We want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Yeah. Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Instagram, at Spaced Out Radio Show. Butch Witkowski. Butch Witkowski. We could start singing Butch's name because it's the final time we will talk to Butch of 2020 before he will start year number six of Strange Days in 2021. His website for Butch Witkowski is in ufocop.com. That's the site. Butch, welcome back. <laughs> You're something else, buddy. <laughs> I am so going to get you a theme song. Butch Witkowski. Butch Witkowski. Anyways, that's as that's, that's far as I got so far. <laughs> I, I don't think Elton John would allow me to go, the Butch, the Butch, the Butch is back. Probably not. <laughs> no. There, there might be some copyright infringement there question coming from twitter uh from okay. greco who owns a beautiful greek restaurant somewhere on the outskirts of toronto never tells me the name of his restaurant though i don't think he wants me there says a high-ranking military person from norad confirmed that the continental u.s airspace is violated with over ten thousand uncorrelated targets a month not aircraft drones blimps or foreign spy craft what do you think these are, Butch? Uh, I I heard that number at 3,700, so I don't know what changed to put it to that number. But, you know, they've been tracking these things <laughs> since 1947 and before. So, um, I mean, they are what they are. I mean, you know, we can tell the difference. And a pair of binoculars, you can tell the difference between a slow walker, which is a satellite, and, and a fast walker, which is an unknown. I mean, that's just very easy to, to, to tell. Um, they're high in the sky. They're fast moving. They're zigzagging. They're up and down. They stop. They turn. They go. Uh, they do things that a, an aircraft, any aircraft that we have, can't do. It just cannot do those type of maneuvers. So, yeah, I'm sure they get a lot of them. Uh, because they cover a wide area. You know, people think, like, oh, well, you know, uh, like the group up there in Cheyenne Mountain, uh, you know, they only watch a certain part of the country or a certain part of North America. They watch everything. And then, you know, what they don't cover, uh, stuff in um, uh, down in Australia at uh, th their looking stations, and you got looking stations in Hawaii and Florida. I mean, everything is covered. So, yeah, the number wouldn't surprise me. Um, but um, I don't know. Uh, it seems like awful high number, though, 10,000. But could be. Seems very high. All right, we talked yeah. a lot about uh, the bipedal canine in the last half hour. but a lot, And that's what you're pretty much, you know, a lot of people know you for. But in 2020, what was... Uh, some of the best paranormal happenings that you investigated? Well, I guess the best one was um, there is a, uh, a farm that we've been watching now for this is our second year. And it's, it's just bizarre. I mean, it's weird stuff goes on down there. And, you know, like uh, I, I talked about this before where a windstorm came through that valley and took out houses and farms and everything and over, rolled over tractor trailers and everything on both sides of the property. This guy didn't even lose a roof tile. And the house is like built in the seven, late 1700s, early 1800s. And a pile of leaves that I had to walk through to get to the spot that I wanted to use the cameras, uh, the leaves were still there. Now, a wind that can blow down, I think they lost, the tree farm lost something like 60 trees blown over and the farm um, to the left of him uh, the barn was taken down and uh, a tractor trailer grain tractor trailer was rolled over and across the street pretty much the same thing at two other farms 
And that pile of leaves is still there to this day. Um, it, it's just, uh, you can see entities. Um, the owner hears music coming from a pond next to the, next to the house, uh, you know, maybe 25, 30 feet from the house. But uh, Lon was with me one time, uh, Lon Strickler, and, you know, he heard the same thing. So it, it's just bizarre. It's a, it's a weird place. Across the field, there's a, 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 a red and blue a light that goes off and on. I went over there. I was right in line with where I should be, and there's nothing there. It's a, a hill uh, of trees and brush. There's no lights. And I'm standing there, and the guys on the other side over at the farm across the field, they're telling me what they're seeing, and I'm standing right there, and they can see me, and they said, the light's right beside you, and there's a light beside me. So, and that's been going on now for a number of years. And uh, it's just paranormal cases are kind of weird because I don't know what category to put them in. Uh, is it... Um, is it, is it truly something that's a, a paranormal? Uh, I mean, he doesn't have he doesn't have anything happening in the house. Everything's happening outside the house. I mean, uh, manifested entities are seen. Uh, we've got them on infrared cameras. We've got them on thermal cameras. Uh, they're multi-witness. Uh, they move. Uh, first time we saw them, they were behind the house, up on top of a, a very large. A construction site that was being built behind the house, and uh, we went down again. They were on a dirt pile, and they were and then they were out in the field at the end of the field. One was in the woods, so it's just it's just a strange place, and it just it's it's so cold out uh, that we can't go anywhere. And of course, you're not supposed to be out anyway. So, uh, and he's kind of tickly about that because he's an older fellow, and you know he doesn't want anybody giving him COVID. <laughs> So, uh, but he does keep in touch and, um, you know, he said, no, nothing happening or, or he heard something out by the pond or something like that. So we did get an underwater camera come spring. We're going to put that down in the pond. Uh, the pond goes, uh, the pond is about, um, I think he said 28 feet deep, 30 feet. So we'll get an under, we'll get an underwater camera in there and check and see what's going on down there. But again, uh, here's a guy that this farm and that, well, that whole row of farms, <clears throat> for about six miles in that valley, that was a Susquehanna, Susquehannock Indian reservation way back. And uh, uh, there are there are known burial grounds, uh, not, on, not that he knows of on his property, but there's two mounds right down the road, maybe a quarter of a mile. So it is what it is. I mean, you know, there's just so many... You can go so far, and then, uh, you know, with an investigation, and then you kind of run out of steam, like nobody knows anything. I mean, they don't even know what's on their own property. And then when you start asking if anything strange is happening on the property, they look at you and go, like, yeah, you showed up. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, paranormal is, you know, some of the stuff that is, I've gone through already, I, I was totally – convinced that what happened happened and then um there were some that i've gone on that i figured like uh yeah you're getting this flashback on your film because you're shooting into a mirror <laughs> with a flash on so it, i always tell happens. people when you it go out happens. anywhere and you use the camera keep the flash off turn off the flash you don't need to flash no matter what you, i mean there could be a a, a shiny little ornament in a corner and you know your flash hits it and all of a sudden it's as big as a wall <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> it happens it happens but uh, you know in regards to these ghostly encounters from the farm or other places have you noticed an uptick because people have been home a lot in 2020 due to you know covid due to lockdowns are you noticing a lot more paranormal cases coming in? No, to be to be honest with you, we've had more cases coming in of UFOs and and uh, Bigfoot and bipedals than we have paranormal. 
Now, at one time in this state of Pennsylvania, we had 350 paranormal groups. 350. And another 275 were in surrounding states that did investigate in Pennsylvania, you know, like down in Gettysburg and all that stuff. And um, over the last, I'm going to say, four or five years, we have lost pretty much three-quarters of them. They've just packed it in or moved on. Um, I mean, you can only investigate Eastern Penitentiary so many times. You can only investigate Gettysburg so many times. And, um, of course, in all the TV shows, there are Eastern Penitentiary and Gettysburg, so a lot of folks can do their uh, investigation by television. Okay. So, UFOs, the amount, and that, and that's quite familiar. We've heard that quite a bit this year, that, you know, whether it's MUFON, whether it's you guys, whether it's Ryan Stacy from Tessa or other investigators out there, that there have been a high, prob- a high uh, amount of UFO sightings. I mean, even the state of New York re- it, uh, recorded like a 281% increase in UFO yeah. sightings. You know, but, yeah. but let me ask you this. Most people don't know what's in the sky. Sure, they can recognize a helicopter or an airplane, but uh-huh. with people staying at home, how many of these alleged UFOs do you think are drones? Well, drones don't go all that high. I mean, um, there's a gentleman up the road here uh, from where I live. He uh, does work uh, with a drone for um, real estate people, you know, takes pictures of stuff with properties. And I forget what he said. He paid for that thing in like $20,000. I mean, it's like (laughs) unbelievable. And he said at 1,500 feet, he said, that's it. He said, that's max. Now, 1,500 feet, if a plane flew over your house at 1,500 feet, you could wave to the pilot, and you could watch him smile and wave back. Uh, these things are high in the sky, and they're, they, they're very tiny. They're very almost like a pinhead, um, unless there's more than one. But when you, know, when you can see, when you can follow something that goes, and I don't, not to be confused with a meteorite or a bolide, because, you know, you're going to see a streak and a tail and all that stuff. But when you see something that can go from, if you're standing in a clear opening, from horizon to horizon in less than a couple seconds and it's zigzagging all the way or it stops and goes, changes color and goes straight up, we don't have anything like that. I mean, uh, I was standing uh, down at a local uh, park, um, which has it's the third darkest spot in the state of Pennsylvania, and thankfully it's not really far away. Uh, the uh, I was standing there with a state trooper, and I was looking out the front with binoculars, and he said, what about this one? <laughs> I turned around, and we're watching one. And at first it looked like it was going pretty slow, but it was just the angle I was looking at. And that's another thing. you got to watch the angle. And you got to remember that you see stuff moving. It could be a star because, you know, you got to remember the Earth is rotating. <laughs> but uh, this thing just kept going, 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 and it kind of almost slowed to a stop. It dropped and made like a U and came back up again and continued on zigzagging. Then it stopped and went straight up. And I looked at him. I said, you see any of those? He said, I see those all the time. So, you know, people say, well, how do you see these things? Well, look up. I mean, that's the only way you're going to get it done. And binoculars. Don't, Don't rely on your eyesight because, you know, like I said, nope, there, there aren't many people that can say, um, you know, a plane's at 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 feet. At 30,000 feet, you won't hear a jet. You just will not hear that engine. 20,000, yeah. And, uh, you know, when it's real high and it's up in that 30, 35,000 range, those collision lights are very small and they all look like they're together. You know, the, and the, the lower it gets, the, the more pronounced you can see the separation. And after, if it's a clear night, you can, you can tell it's a plane right away. But... Um, Drones, I know that they have a drone or two companies have drones out now that look just like flying saucers. I mean, they are just an image of flying saucers, lights all around them and stuff like that. 
and but they're usually put up in neighborhoods out you know the midwest <laughs> people are calling in all over the place that there's flying saucers but you got to remember they're not silent i mean they're noisy they make a noise they're not silent they they make a whirring sound and uh, they the maneuvers are not steady in other words they can go up and down but when they go side to side or anything like that there's a hesitation because it's getting that transmission from the control panel to the craft so um, the things that you're looking for as far as UFOs are high in the sky very fast moving could be an orb could be a tube could be a square could be pretty much any shape <coughs> excuse me and um, they have uh, a very fast, very fast moving. I mean, they'll catch your eye. You could be looking someplace else and if something's moving over there that fast, you'll see it right away. But I always say to people, you know, wait till it's a cool night. Right now is the best time to go out and look for UFOs. Cold weather, cold, clear night, dress for it, you know, um, and a good pair of binoculars. Preferably you want to get the kind that do not fog. Uh, don't smoke, uh, don't talk. If you are going to be talking, you want to cover your mouth so you don't get, you know, um, breath in front of in front of the camera or the binoculars. If you're going to use a camera, digital, uh, set it up to shoot at infinity. Uh, no flash. Uh, video, same thing. Uh, set it, run it, run your uh, scope out to infinity, and uh, I always use a tripod because it gets very tiresome holding that and binoculars at the same time. So if you just put it on a tripod, point it straight up, or you can get you can get a sky cam. Sky cams aren't expensive at all. Uh, you can get those on the internet, and just they just mount on top of a uh, it's a dome with a camera. Uh, in it, and it's made by Sony. Uh, they, they make it. Panasonic makes one, and you can you just put it on top of a tripod and uh, hooks. You can hook it up to a battery or run up if you're close to your house. Just run a cable out and run it off electric. And uh, most of them have a, um, a plug on the side where you can run it right to a laptop and watch everything off a laptop inside the house while that's outside recording. But um, and it's just, it doesn't shoot anything side to side, it just shoots the sky straight up. So there's there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, some of the best sightings that I've ever had were right here at this house, and I've only moved here two years ago. So, um, it's like I said the other night, I was watching you know a gang of them up on the uh, uh, north of my house. Uh, I, have, I have a tree line behind me, but my house sits higher than the tree line. So I have clear sky front and back of the house, and uh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Very cool. I want to get to a question from our chat room here from the Ronald Penton. Yes, the Ronald Penton. And he is asking, Butch, would investigators really trip your trigger? Mm. Uh as far as uh, doing their due diligence, I would probably say uh, uh, David Pilates, um In the ufology field, there are just so many. Um, I, I don't even think I could pick one. There's just so many of them. Uh, crypto field. Um, uh, Probably Blackburn, um, Paranormal, Jason Hawes, I guess, would be one. Uh, but ufology, there's just so many of them. I mean, Jack Carey, cryptids out in the four corners. There's, you know, there's a, there's a lot of them out there that are good. Um, but I, I, I just don't. I don't think I could just come up with, you know, one super duper guy. Um, I mean, there's there's guys out there that really do their thing. They really, really do. Some of them are loners. They go by themselves. There's no, they're not involved in any groups or anything like that. And, um, 
there's a photographer out in Washington State. Uh, and, oh, uh, God, his name is uh, Ronnie Becker. He's a professional photographer, uh, Bigfoot guy. Uh, he's been at it now for 25 years. He's by himself. Uh, he has a certain area that he's been researching. And uh, he has, like, top-notch equipment and stuff. And he's got some good shots, but they're not clear for some reason. I've never figured that one out. But it, there's, there's, there's a lot of good people out there. And... Um, I'm just I'm just thankful that I know a bunch of them. Uh, you know, I can I can count on them if I got an issue or a problem or I can't find something or you know I screwed something up doing something else. But well, well, um, well let's we, we only got about two and a half minutes here before we got to go to break. Let's flip the tides because and I don't want to name names here, but tell us a couple of real bonehead moves that you heard about in 2020 from investigators out there. Oh, bonehead moves. <laughs> Oh, there's a lot of them. Uh, uh, the the one that uh, cranks me, and I'm not going to name a name, but here's a story I got. Uh, gentleman's in the hospital for some unknown illness, and uh, a lady hears his name on a radio show, and she's living in California, and she calls her friend who lives in the same area this guy does and she happens to be a nurse at that hospital and she goes in asking him for his autograph and then another nurse comes in and asks him for his autograph and I'm going like wait, wait, whoa, whoa, wait a minute so a person in California here's your name on a radio show calls the hospital that you're in talks to her friend who then gets to you in your room and asks for an autograph, and then another nurse comes in and gets your autograph. And I said, do you really expect me to believe that? Yep. Oh, okay. So they're out there, man. They're out there. And, and you know, it all, a, a guy told me this a long, long time ago. He says, beware of the guys that are out for fortune and glory. He said, they will do anything and say anything they have to to get their names out there or to make a buck. And we've never charged anybody a dime. Matter of fact, it's on our website. We don't take donations, um, period. Because once you start doing that stuff, you get beholden to somebody, and that will come back to bite you. I guarantee it. So uh, I don't charge anybody for information. I don't charge them to go over their photographs. I, I, I just don't do it, I, and I won't do it. And uh, but there's people out there. I there was a lady in oh God, what county was she in? Does I guess it doesn't matter what county she was in. But she had some noises in the house, and uh, a paranormal team from that particular area, I think it was Cameron County, uh, went in and charged her 400 bucks. Walked around the house for 30 minutes, and yeah, we took care of it for you, and walked out the door at 400 nice. cash. Nice, nice, Butch. Yeah. We do have to ask before we go to break here. How much you charge for an autograph? Free. I doubt that. I highly doubt that. Butch Witkowski will be signing autographs. Fifty nine ninety five. Your choice, black or white or color. As we got it, hour number three. We'll go with Butch. Then we got the Newswire and the Thought of the Day next on Spaced Out Radio. Yes, Butch will sign those autographs, but uh, be damned if you're allowed to make eye contact with them. So. <laughs> All right, I'll be right back, Butch. Yeah, I've got to go get a drink there. I'm thirsty. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences we have.
This is where guitar man Ron Bumble put fire on. I have to tell you that I love to get to get the little brother and his wife from Space Time Radio Fan. It's amazing how music can inspire and make you feel deeper about what's going on with the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, BumbleFoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I have. Make sure you keep on listening because with Space Time Radio, you know the little brother is watching. Feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do? What to do? Why not get Bumble Fuck? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning Bumble f- Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at Kajans.com. Looking for creative ways to get your company out in the public? How about advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Our sales department is waiting to hear from you, and we can work around any budget. From commercial spots to banners to special promotions, there are many opportunities to get your name and product out to our SOR listeners. For a price guide and more information, please contact us at sales at spaceoutradio.com. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and bombs to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Alright, I'm back, Butch. Okay. All right, where do you want to go this final half hour of 2020 for you? Well, we can go with questions. All right. Audience questions for Butch. Make sure you put them in capital letters if you're in one of our chat rooms, so that way I can see them. I don't skip over them. Do Canadians like Super Troopers? No, I, I like Guardians. I'm a Space Force Guardian guy. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty neat name they came up with. Yeah, it was all right. <coughs> All right, we got a, a less than a minute here. Yeah, how's your numbers? Good, good. We're in the 150 to 160 range. Oh, the song Super Trooper by ABBA. All right. Let's... 
let's uh, get things going here. And uh, we got 20 seconds. Big thank you again to Cat Chaser, Adam, Swamp Monkey, TH, Lori, Human Carl, and Cat Chaser once again for the amazing Super Chats tonight. Thank you to everyone who's given us a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button on our channel. Here comes Hour 3. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate the time that you guys spend with us. We want to welcome back everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. Remember, you can check out all of our archives for free by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor Hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Yester Tempest. Yester Tempest is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, the final time of 2020, we introduce Butch Witkowski from UF4Cop.com. We do this strange days. We've been doing it for five years. We're going to do it in year number six next year as well. Butch's website, UF4Cop.com. Butch, welcome back. Um, I'm back. <laughs> All right. We got some audience questions here for you, my friend. Okay. And uh, we're going to ask them right off the bat here. Scott is asking, what do you think dogmen are? Hmm. Well. I think they're flesh and blood. That I believe. Uh, I, 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 I guess I'd pretty much go along with the Watchers as far as um, they're guarding burial grounds and stuff like that. Because everywhere they've been seen, there's burial grounds and burial mounds close by. So, And they don't go out of that area. I mean, they stay within that loop. I mean, if they were something that was just roaming around, we'd, we'd have them, you know, everywhere. Okay, so the fact that they are flesh and blood, all right, that would, do you think they are a, and this may sound a little woo, but do you think they are a species that is connected to Earth or that they have been dropped off here? I, I think they're connected to the Earth. I, I They go back way too far to not be. Um, there's never been, like I said, we've had sightings of Bigfoot where the UFOs were sighted also. We've never had anything that we can find uh, anywhere, and not only in Pennsylvania, but anywhere uh, where there are bipedals, um, where there's uh, any involvement with a UFO. Hmm. All right, let's move on to another question from our audience. Let's go to the Ronald Penton again. The Ronald Penton. Butch, have you heard of any strange goings on around Somerset, Pennsylvania? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, um, up around the old the old turnpike, the part that's closed, the old tunnels, um, there are two reports that I, I would probably classify them as Bigfoot reports. Um, uh, two of them at the same time. In other words, running as a pair. Um, and the difference in time, I think, the September, mid-September was one uh, sighting of the two. And uh, late November was the sighting of the two again inside one of the old tunnels where they, I guess they store, store salt and stuff for the turnpike. But... Um, 
the guy said there's prints there, but he doesn't know how to take a print. So I told him to take photographs, and I didn't get them yet. So we'll see what happens with that. All right. Moving on. Let's go to another question from our audience here. Uh, Big Dog is asking, Butch, have you looked into Lake Monsters, and what's your theory on this? Uh, no, I have not, but I have an interest in Champ, uh, up in Lake Champlain. So um, there's a real good researcher up there. She's been out a long time. Uh, could they exist? Yeah, I guess. Uh, you got that uh, video that was on the net uh, of the uh, serpent-like thing moving through uh, the water up in uh, Alaska. So yeah, I guess, you know, look, uh, we haven't... Uh, after, uh, what do they say? Ninety-eight percent of this planet's covered in water. We've only ever explored one per less than one percent. So I'm sure there's stuff out there that you know we don't know about. And just recently, was well, just a few days ago, a young girl with a uh, got a picture of a um, in Loch Ness of uh, a head poking above the water. And uh, they checked out the the photograph, and it's a real deal. So. Who knows? I mean, that's a there's the, the Loch Ness has more water in its territory, its 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 area, than all the lakes and streams in in that area, in the whole in the whole county. You know, you know, like <laughs> just none there. It's just huge, and you know, um, there's underground. They there there are caves. There are old. Uh, one of the theories, I guess, is uh, volcanic tubes, uh, ice age kind of stuff, and those tubes take, you know, lead out to the ocean. So could there be something going back and forth in those tubes? Yeah, I guess. But you know, they they do a lot of a lot of research in that area. They really do. Plus, they got cameras that are 24/7, you know, running all the time, looking down at. At the, at the area, but this uh, young girl uh, evidently got a picture of something, um, and they say it's a good picture, so I guess we'll see. All right, moving on here, another question, this one coming from M. Dane. Butch, have you seen the Dark Waters video where a young man took a live video and a dog man right in front of the camera? If so, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I, yeah, I did see that. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it, it's not definitive, but you know, it, it, it's what it looks like. And um, uh, Waters is a really good guy, and you know, he he knows what he's talking about. And uh, down in his area, you know, you got Rougarou, which is basically bipedal canine. And uh, yeah, so. That's that's the ticket. I mean, you know, to be at the right place at the right time with the right type of equipment, and you can have an answer that you've been looking for for a long time. Interesting. All right, moving on here. Let's go to another question from our audience. Nicola is asking, does Butch do anything around Whitehall, New York? Uh, we've been up around the uh, caves uh, located right below West Point. Uh, that was more of a paranormal adventure because uh, some a group that does go up there a lot from Pennsylvania was having issues with equipment where you know they could put new batteries in flashlights, new batteries in in, uh, in cameras, and all that kind of stuff. And if they walk inside the cave, everything goes dead. Um, we went up just to see what they were talking about it, it's it happens now whether that's something geological you know in the rock or in that area don't know but uh, fresh batteries and a flashlight right out of the pack in the flashlight works outside step over that line into the cave and the flashlight is dead and I think those caves were are, I call them a cave, but they're more or less they were they were uh, dugouts in the side of a mountain to hold prisoners during the Revolutionary War. And we have those here in Berks County also. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, let's move on here. Brett Lewis, I think he needs a date 
because he's asking, what do the lady Sasquatches out there find attractive? <laughs> Certainly none of my guys. <laughs> I, I would I would probably think a guy like Dave with the beard would be enticing. I, I, could, I could agree with that. I could agree with that. You know, the only lady lady uh, Bigfoot that's ever been seen is Patty from the Patterson Gimlin film. There's never been any other recorded or mentioned, actually. That is very weird. Why is that? I don't know. I don't know. She's been around a long time. Well, she's pretty old now. Probably collecting Social Security somewhere. <laughs> yeah. She's waiting on her $600 check. That's right. That's right. Yeah, does Bigfoot qualify for the $600 check? That, that's the next question we'll have on Spaced Out Radio here. But, you know, I mean, that there are a lot of researchers out there who believe that there are very few female Sasquatch, though. I mean... This is actually a real thing because, Butch, there are a number of First Nations I know in my area that believe because of the lack of female Sasquatch species, this is the reason why a lot of First Nations and Indigenous women are targeted by the wild man. Yeah, yeah. And plus the fact that look at all the missing Indigenous women in that area. Mm-hmm. Very right. That is kind of a weird uh, thing, though, with the species, though, Butch. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, a lot of people have described Bigfoot all shapes and sizes, but Patty's the only one who was ever described as a female. Vinny is asking, do you think Bigfoot is responsible for many of the missing 411 people? Could be. I mean, even Dave Pallady said that, you know, it could be. Um, you have a couple researchers out there that um, swear and declare and claim that uh, Bigfoot eats people. <laughs> now, I don't know how they know that, but it's crazy. And, of course, those are the same people that say that the government has them all locked up somewhere. All right, let's go to M. Dane. I have thought about declaring myself an independent nation and applying for my own government help. Well, <laughs> then you're going to have to pay yourself, my friend. You're going to have to pay yourself. All right, you know, uh, questions are, are, are pretty much done for right now, Butch. You know, looking towards okay. 2021... You know, what is your goals for this coming year? Obviously, we're going to be starting it off with still the COVID headache that everyone has. But, I mean, it is in the depths of winter. But I, I guess you're like anybody. You're hoping that by the time spring comes around, there are some answers and some lifting of the restrictions. Yeah, that well, that and, you know, as long as we have this weather right now, which is, at, you know, between 45 and 55, I mean, we'd go. Uh, the only thing holding us up is places we want to go are shut down. So, um, I mean, the expeditions are already planned. Uh, all the uh, things that we have to do for um, motels and places like that, that's all set up. Uh, so, I mean, as, as soon as that gets lifted, uh, we're gone. We're, we're just going to, I mean, trucks are ready, equipment's ready, everything, everything's ready to go. We're ready to go. Okay, so, you know, but there's still the restrictions that you have to worry about. You know, do you head, when those restrictions are lifted, do you head straight to the Lycan Loop? Where, where are you going? Yeah, uh, we'll be going um, to the where we had the first two sightings. We're going to spend, uh, that'll be the first weekend up there. And then from there, we're going to head uh, southeast to a spot where we had three or four and that's going to be a caving expedition there. And we already have permission. It's a private cave. I mean, it's on private property, so we had to get permission, which we got. We got that already. 
So, um, and it's it's uh, that's going to be a big one because that's we're going to take extra people along for that only because of the depth of the cave, which is about um, quarter of a mile in, and there's a gradual slope and then it goes down and it's flooded. So we don't want to, you know, put anybody at risk. Uh, so we'll have extra people there plus extra equipment for that. And um, so we'll see what happens. But it, like I said, it's, it's all up to this this crap getting pulled, you know, get done with. Well, let's hope so. Let's hope so. Because I know i got to head to the States here soon. I'm getting that itch. I need that itch. <laughs> you know? But that's just me. I, I'm already tired of the cold, and it hasn't even got cold here yet. All right. We're moving on here. Butch, you know, we talked a little bit about UFOs. We talked about uh, – hold on. My screen just went off. Oh, this is weird. Oh, there we go. Now we seem to be back a little bit. My screen's popped off there for a second. That was weird. All right. Well, we, we've talked UFOs. We've talked a little bit of Bigfoot. We've talked some of the – bipedal canine and a little bit of paranormal you know some of the weirder cases and stories you heard from 2020 this past year what were they what were the sightings people were having well pretty much everything i mean ufos and and bigfoot bipedal canines uh uh rakes uh so i mean it's been a whole gamut of stuff um what's the weirdest the what's, what's, what's the weirdest creature though that has been reported to you in 2020? The rake. All right, let's delve into this. For people who may not know, what is the rake? Uh, very tall, very slim, very pale. Um, it uh, feeds on humans, according to everything that's out there. Um, very, very long, skinny arms. So, you know, you can almost see internal organs. That's how skinny they are. Um, if people really want to see a good representation, if they go uh, on and Google, Rake watches a moose. A guy actually videotapes, and you can you can see the the creature watching the moose. So, um, it, the one we have uh, that's close by is uh, was seen on a farm that's within the uh, confines of uh, French, Creek, French Creek State Park, and um, there are four or five properties within the park that are still privately owned because the park was put up after those people. I mean, those people already lived there before the park was put up, so they're still there. And the one is like a, a mini farm, and uh, he actually took a shot at one. So, but we can't get in the park and talk to him because I don't, I don't want to discuss this whole thing over a telephone. I want to go into the park. I want to go to his place. I want to see because he he shot and missed and hit his barn. So he said, the bullet's still there and he can show me exactly. And he did take some pictures of what he says he thought were footprints. So I want to see that face to face. I don't want to do that over the phone or on the internet. I, uh, so that's, you know, I, I guess the rake is the weirdest one. All right, no fairies, no gnomes, no nothing in 2020? No, no, last gnome I saw was out in my backyard. I shot him. Oh, that's terrible. That's <laughs> terrible. Terrible. How, how could you talk like that? <laughs> now you're going to get me in trouble. Uh, M. Dane is asking, Butch, have you done any research on the burial mounds, like set cameras to catch anything? Just curious. I've never heard of anyone doing that. Yeah. Yeah, we've done that a couple times. Um, there's one down in Ole that is really strange because there's some uh, some glyphs on some rocks uh, aside of the burial mound. And uh, we put up two uh, infrared trail cams there and really didn't get anything. Uh, but, of course, two weeks after we left that area, uh, the lady called and said she heard a lot of screaming and carrying on coming down uh, at that part of the farm where these rocks and these glyphs are. And she actually called the state police, and they got there, and they didn't see anything. So 
uh, I told her, so as soon as we can get out of here and get down there, I'm just going to put a camera down there and leave it there. Anything caught on those cameras? They're good for like 90 days. What's that? Anything caught on those cameras? Uh, Yeah, we caught one of the horses, and we caught some birds. Uh, We caught a mist, but I don't know if that mist was natural or if that was something that was was not natural. So what I'm going to have to do is back the cameras up so I have more of a, a field of vision. I guess I had them too close to say that, I can't say that that mist that was around those rocks was just around the rocks and no place else. I mean, it could have been the whole field was like that. So I got to back the camera up to another tree line there and just get a wider, a wider shot of the, of the rocks. But the mound is right there. I mean, the the rocks are on one side, the mounds on the other. That's a pretty good sized mound. Mm -hmm. And that area was inhabited by the Lenny Lenape, uh, um, Indian tribe, um, they moved on with the Mohawks up into New York. Duke from World Bigfoot Radio is asking, how does mist trigger a game cam? How does what? Mist trigger a game cam. Uh, that cam runs, that t- that doesn't trigger it. Our, the cameras that we have are security cams. So they take a photograph every second i can set them for one second three seconds or six seconds so once that's set at one second that camera is going to take a photograph every second it just keeps taking the photographs and uh unlike game cams where you know something has to walk in front of it to trigger it these you don't have to walk in front of a trigger they're taking that photograph every second oh nice nice they look they look they look like a trail cam only they're bigger they're taller and wider and they make no sound you can't you could stand there and listen to it while it's taking pictures and and then when you take your SD card out of course you have to have a, a good size SD card I mean you know one gig ain't gonna cut it so we have we have uh, and the one is 30 gig and the other one I think is 50 gig card and they'll run for 90 days. Um, and that's taking a picture every, uh, and I can set that for black and white color or, or, or infrared. So, um, yeah, uh, and there it's, it's like a game cam, but it's actually a security camera made for farms, people to watch cattle and stuff like that. You know, people have a lot of equipment around and stuff like that. Construction companies use them. Right. Right. Butch, 25 seconds left. And 2020 on Spaced Out Radio is over for you. You're probably cheering right now, probably waving your flags, <laughs> you know. But uh, I want to say a big thank you, my friend, for being a big special part of what we do here. And all the best to you in 2021 for you, your family, and your research team as well. And that goes for your your people, yourself, your family, and the store group are great people. A lot of neat questions, a lot of good comments. Um, and I guess we'll see you in January, what, the 25th? Somewhere around there, 25, 26, whatever it may be, Wayne Gretzky's 60th birthday. But nonetheless, (laughs) we'll talk to you very soon, Butch. Thank you. Coming up next, we have the SOR Newswire and the Thought of the Day. Stay tuned. Spaced Out Radio returns right after this. Butch Wachowski, everybody. Butch Wachowski, Strange Days, the Butch, the Butch, the Butch is badass. Right there. Look at that. Big Happy New Year to everybody. Oh, look at the hair today. My hair is just horrible. My hair is just horrible. <laughs> look at that. You're a sick man, Dave. <laughs> uh, hey, I could lend you some of this. <laughs> Boy, you could lend me a lot. Oh, my God. Yeah, believe it or not, my neck is so sore, my toque there is bothering me. Bothering my head. <laughs> oh, well, shit happens. Okay, shit. my friend. All right. All right. 
I will talk to you very, very soon. And uh, all the best and uh, much love, my buddy. Stay well. All right, you too. Take care. Good night. See ya. Butch Witkowski, everybody. Butch Witkowski. <coughs> I don't know about you guys, but that super butch is one sexy butch. I heard he has a calendar coming out for 2021. Uh, my hair doesn't need beard oil right now. It just needs uh, another washing. I washed it twice today. I look like Bigfoot. I look like Bigfoot. Mm, Bigfoot. Nice clown there, Marty. Nice clown for Super Butch. Scrolling down, today's thought of the day. There it is. I'm not trying to look like a wild man, but it just turned out that way. The hair hasn't been cooperative at all today. Got about two and a half minutes. Marty's Clowns, you have to go to hashtag Spaced Out Radio on Twitter. Because he posts a new clown every night. Because the Cuter Rebra song that we use for the thought of the day reminds me of clown music. I'm tired. Thank you, Sukvinder. If you're out of here, we appreciate you finally making it to our chat room, man. Thank you. And uh, appreciate you. Thank you for enjoying our programming and joining us for the first time, man. That is awesome. Awesome! All right. We got like uh, 30 seconds. <clears throat> Brett Lewis, I hope that never happens, my friend. I hope that never happens. Thank you to everybody who uh, participated in the Super Chat tonight, everyone who's given us 132 thumbs up, and here we go. Home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott, and I appreciate.
appreciate you all tuning on in. Thank you so much for being there with us. I want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, you can check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Speaking of the news. This world, Star Trek star James Duen's remains were apparently smuggled aboard the International Space Station, a secret mission kept under wraps for 12 years. Richard Garriott, the famed entrepreneur and video game developer, also known as Lord British, who created the Ultima series, hid Duen's remains among his belongings and then placed them beneath a floor piece aboard the ISS. It was completely clandestine, he says. His family were very pleased that the ashes made it up there, but we were all disappointed we didn't get to talk about it publicly for so long. Now enough time has passed that we can. As far as I know, no one has ever seen it there, and no one has ever moved it. James Doohan got his resting place among the stars. After twice being denied their request to send Doohan's ashes to the station, Doohan's family contacted Garriott just days before his 12-day private mission to the station in 2008. Richard said, We've got to keep his hush-hush for a little while, and here we are 12 years later, Duen's son Chris says. What did he? What he did was touching. It meant so much to me, my family, and it would have meant so much to my dad. Duen played Montgomery Scotty Scott in Star Trek, reprising his roles in six live-action films, featuring the show's cast, Star Trek Generations, and episodes Relic of Star Trek's The Next Generation, and voicing him in Star Trek The Animated Series as well. Good Canadian kid. Good Canadian kid as well as uh, Captain Kirk. We needed a couple of good Canadians on there. Yeah, Scotty Doohan was actually a Canadian war hero as well, by the way, just so you know, back in World War II. The guy was badass, complete badass. Check it on out. His story is online. Now, Captain Shirk didn't get this one, but I, I kind of threw it in. Why? Because it, it literally happened like an hour south of me. So there's this antiquity hobby shop, you know, the little touristy shop that you go in. And right before you go in the front door, they have this awesome giant piece of jade, this boulder. It's like 2,850 pounds. Well, a couple of weeks ago, this was actually stolen from the Caribou Jade Shop in Cache Creek. Now, if you look up Cache Creek on the BC map, literally, it is, it's got two streets. The highway going north-south and one going east. That's it. Well, besides a few little residential streets, but that's about it. Anyways, the Jade Boulder, though, has been recovered, Sergeant Darren Angman said. We've identified suspects and the investigation still ongoing. Angman says there were no arrests that have been made in the investigation so far, uh, but they're still trying to tie the theft to the subjects or to the suspects. Heidi Roy, who owns the Jade Shop and whose father Ben installed the boulder outside the shop in 1985, is thrilled to have it back. We're so happy to have it back in one piece, although with a few scars from its adventure. That thank you to all of you who have been keeping an eye out and sending in their tips, as well as the kind words of sympathy and encouragement we've received from across the country. It is clear that this stone meant a lot to many more than we realized. Now, two Ashcroft residents who were returning from Kamloops spotted a pickup truck towing a flat deck trailer with an excavator on it, leaving the Jade Shop back on December 19th. They saw the boulder on the flat deck and pursued the truck, which was heading east on Highway 1 towards Kamloops. They called in to 911, but turned around after a man thought to be associated with the theft, threw a boulder at them near the ghost of Wallachin pullout near Cash Creek. 
Jarrett Fitzpatrick, who was driving the vehicle, said although the damage to the vehicle, to his vehicle, sucked, he would do it again to try and catch the thieves. He wants to give big thanks to Bill Elliott and the Caribou Jade Shop, who contacted him to say they would pay for his deductible for the repairs. Now, this boulder is awesome. It's been there like 35 years. Why anybody would want to steal it, that's really too bad. Really too bad. The world's former largest iceberg continues to break apart into smaller pieces on the doorstep of a major marine wildlife haven home to millions of macaroni and king penguins in Antarctica. This comes less than a week after the mammoth iceberg known as A68A first split in two. Scientists at the U.S. National Ice Center spotted the two newest pieces, A68E and A68F, Boy, are they original. On December 22nd, using images from a satellite, this means that there are now four separate iceberg fragments, including A68D, which will eventually drift away from the others. Sail away, sail away, sail away. It's like Orinoco flow down there. As of April, it measured 2,000 square miles and over just uh, the size of the state of Delaware. Well, that's broken up. The good news is, because experts had feared that This was going to literally crash into an animal sanctuary where they hunt for food, all of these penguins. Well, the good news is the animals have to travel a distance, and it looks like they're going to be safe now. It really does. So disaster seems to be averted for now. Penguins are going to be able to eat. The icebergs have decided to split off instead of being mega berg that was going to take down the penguin world. No, instead it decided to say... We're out. We're breaking up. It's over. It's kind of like, I don't know, name a band. They just split up in four and all went their separate ways. Here's scary for journalism in this world. All right? Very scary. A Chinese citizen journalist who covered Wuhan's coronavirus outbreak has been jailed for four years. Zhang Zhan was found guilty of picking quarrels and provoking trouble, a frequent charge against activists. The 37-year-old former lawyer was detained in May and has been on a hunger strike for several months. Her lawyers say she is in poor health. Ms. Zhang is one of several citizen journalists who have run into trouble for reporting on Wuhan. There is no free media in China, and authorities are known to clamp down on activists or whistleblowers seen as undermining the government's response to the COVID outbreak. Ren Kianu, one of Zhang Zhan's lawyers, expressed concerns for her physical and mental well-being, saying she is very weak and on a hunger strike. Mr. Ren said his client looked devastated when her sentence was announced and her mother sobbed loudly. In the video interview with an independent filmmaker before her arrest, Ms. Zhang said she decided to travel to Wuhan in February after reading an online post by a resident about life in the city during it. Once there, she began documenting what she saw on the streets and hospitals in live streams and essays despite threats from authorities, and her reports were widely shared on social media. The rights group Network of Chinese Human Rights Defenders said her reports also covered the detention of other independent journalists and the harassment of families of victims who were seeking accountability. Maybe I have been a rebellious soul. I have just documented the truth. Why can't I show the truth, she said in a clip obtained by the BBC. I won't stop what I'm doing because this country can't go backwards. Ms. Zhang went missing on 14th of May, according to the CHRD. One day later, it was revealed that she had been detained by police in Shanghai more than 400 miles away. She was formally charged in November. The indictment sheet alleges she sent false information through text, video, and other media platforms like WeChat, Twitter, and YouTube. She is also accused of accepting interviews with foreign media outlets and maliciously spreading information about a virus in Wuhan. A sentence of four to five years was recommended. That's horrible. Horrible human rights right there. Horrible. We got to be better on this planet. We have to be. A pilot in Southern California has captured what appears to be a person flying a jetpack, the first visual evidence of an unexplained flying object that seems similar to reported jetpack sightings near Los Angeles International Airport in August. But we still have a lot of questions about what we're seeing in the video, and local authorities haven't shared any answers. 
The video captured by a pilot for a Sling Pilot Academy and uploaded to YouTube is from December 21st and was captured at an altitude of roughly 3,000 feet near Palos Verde, California. The island is in the background is Catalina Island, according to the reports. You know, there's a lot of sharks in there. If this guy crashes, he's food, by the way. He is food. Lots of great whites in that area. Anyways, an American Airlines pilot first reported a jetpack sighting near LAX in August, but all we had was transcript of the pilot's conversation with air traffic control. This new video provides a look at what might have been the same type of aircraft or could be something else entirely. We simply don't know. At this point, the video looks kind of blurry. Of course it does. If this is a guy in a jetpack, then it remains to be seen whether it is legal to test flight jetpacks or related the jetpack sightings near LAX recently that caused disruptions with air traffic. I don't know about this, but the guy's not an alien. This is a guy with some serious balls doing this. All right? I wouldn't be doing it, especially over an area where there is great white sharks in the water. What is wrong with you people? Terrible. A Kentucky man... (laughs) I love this story. I do. Because when I first saw the video, I thought, I need one of these. We need to legalize flamethrowers in Canada. We do. Because a Kentucky man showed off his unusual method of clearing snow from his driveway... By the way, I had no idea that Kentucky actually got snow. With a video showing him using a flamethrower to remove the unwanted snow from his driveway. Timothy Browning posted a video to Facebook showing him dressed up as Cousin Eddie from Christmas Vacation while drinking beer and using a flamethrower to clear the snow from his driveway. Browning Snow Services, God bless America, Browning wrote on his Facebook post, Browning's unusual snow removal was caught on camera from the porch of a neighbor's home. Honestly, this is fantastic. It really is fantastic. Here he is, dressed up like Cousin Eddie, cigar hanging from his mouth, beer in his hand, and a flamethrower. I want to hire him for my driveway. Literally, I I need to have a snowblower go over my driveway right now. I'm too lazy to do it. Flamethrower? That's the way to do it. Complete way to do it. Honestly, this guy's a hero. We need flamethrowers in Canada for this exact purpose. A mysterious monolith made out of gingerbread appeared in the Corona Heights Park of San Francisco on Christmas Day. It is unclear who is behind the object, which combines two of 2020's trends, home baking and mysterious structures, Its arrival delighted many in Corona Heights, and yes, the neighborhood name predates the pandemic. Uh, I was pretty shocked when I first saw the gingerbread monolith product. Manager Josh Ackerman said other monoliths have popped up around the world in recent weeks. The first, a mysterious metal pillar, which was discovered in the desert in Utah last month before it disappeared a week later. Like its Utah predecessor, the gingerbread monolith is three-sided, with rectangles of each gingerbread apparently held together by icing. Its internal structure is unclear. Mr. Ackerman, who tweeted the photo, said that he has been on social media uh, this post about the structure before he went on a run on Christmas morning, but did not believe the news. In a way, I felt like the gingerbread monolith totally captured the quirkiness of this city, and I thought that it perfectly represented many reasons of why I love San Francisco. His response was echoed by other residents in the city, with one Twitter user describing the monolith's appearance as the perfect act of San Francisco defiance. So what's next for the gingerbread monolith? It seems there's going to, there's hope for its future, at least in the short term, with the general manager of the city's Recreation and Parks Department, Phil Ginsburg, telling California residents that we will leave it up until the cookie crumbles. That is good. You know, the sad part about this is, There is going to be a resident or two out there who's going to say, what if that gingerbread house is not, or that monolith is not made from food that is healthy for animals? I can see it now. Somebody's going to gripe about this. It's going to be about it collapsing and animals getting sick because there's chocolate Smarties or M&Ms on there. Oh, this is going to lead to a big brawl. Big, big brawl. Somebody's going to do it. 
Somebody's going to do it. Here's a really cool story. A Virginia man whose 1969 Camaro was stolen 17 years ago has been reunited with the vehicle after spotting it in a garage while helping a friend buy another vehicle. Tommy Cook said the Hugger Orange Camaro was stolen from his auto repair lot in Woodbridge in 2003. After reporting it stolen, he kept renewing the vehicle's missing status with Prince William County Police through the mail and ensuing years. I never wrote that car off, Cook stated. I knew there would be a day and a time where I could get the car back. I didn't know where, but I knew it was out there somewhere, watching me. Cook said he had no idea, no leads, until 17 years later when a friend considering the purchase of a 1968 Camaro asked him to take a look at the vehicle listed for sale by a Maryland man near La Plata. Cook said he arrived at the auto shop, took a look at the 1968 Camaro, but his attention was grabbed by the hoodless 1969 Camaro in the corner of the garage. The man told Cook the green car had originally been painted Hugger Orange, the color of his stolen car. Cook said he took a look at the dashboard VIN and thought it seemed suspicious, so he checked the VIN in another spot of the hood, and it matched his missing car. The Charles County Sheriff's Office in Maryland had the Camaro towed to a storage lot, and Cook then had it towed to his new shot. Cook said the car has received some upgrades since he last owned it, including an engine being installed in the formerly engineless car. He said the car had apparently changed hands four times since it was stolen in 2003. Somebody had put money into it, Cook said. It was better than it was when it was stolen, but it's still an ugly green. And finally tonight, another stupid Guinness World Record. Idiotic. Dumb. An Idaho man with a talent for breaking Guinness World Records captured his latest title by throwing 52 nuts in the air and catching them in a can attached to his head. I don't know what else there is to say about this, but, dude, get a life. 52 nuts in his head. Not even impressed. Not even impressed. Get to do it one minute. Garbage. Thought of the name happens every night at this time where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages. Then read your responses on the air because we love the audience participation around here. Today's thought of the day is as follows. What's been your best supernatural paranormal UFO experience of 2020? Super Marty, one of our favorite veterans who listens to this show. We love our veterans here. Living in this Twilight Zone episode known as the COVID-19 pandemic. Great clown, Marty. Alex, my vision of post-apocalyptic America filled with Nazi super soldiers, Nessie, Orbs, and Jan Harzan in the White House, also known as the five minutes I spent on BitChute. I don't even know what BitChute is. 13 Ballads, the friendly supernatural werewolf skinwalkers of Skinwalker Ranch. Well, that's nice. That's nice. Let's move over here. Nikki, strangest? No, hardest? Yes. The removal of a hybrid baby of four months. I felt it. I remembered it. Couldn't stop crying for a long time. Hormones suck. Debbie, my daughter seeing a gray alien in our home back in March and then having her seizure-like issues after we, which we got tests done, and now she's perfectly healthy. Oh, weird. Michael. Getting lost while quantum jumping. Okay. I guess I'll have to go with the snappy tune. Three blind mice, Captain Shirk says, being played on a recorder inside my apartment Christmas Eve night. No one in here but me, and I don't own a recorder. All right, let's move on. Russell. Concluding that my thoughts have synchronized with the internet iPhone in symbiosis. Davey, getting totally surrounded by the mist when driving up to Carlton Moor to Skywatch and my GPS tracker showing that we had suddenly traveled seven miles and back in a matter of a minute or so in a straight line where there is no roads. Oh, wow. Davey, you're going to have to tell us that story. Kira. Doing a house blessing for a friend who lost his wife, her spirit audibly calling his name three times to me with an electronic tone at the end. Chills went up my body. 
Whoa. Eric with a K. We are Eric's fourth favorite show. No, we're number four. Anyways, Eric says, Happy Jack, Arizona, May this year. 7,700 feet up at the mountains, camping, and we filmed an orb. Amazing. Actually, I've seen the video. It's actually pretty cool. That's Eric with a K for you. Gabe. Been having some weird situations where I swear things are one way and all of a the sudden there's another, like some kind of dimensional shift or something. I also removed some energy demons from my body. I was so weak I slept all day. Christine, that UFOs were mysteriously absent. Kevin, after a nine-month-long, almost daily investigation into locating the Ohio grass man, my break of the case came when I inadvertently sent marked one of their paths. Okay, it's probably a good place to leave it right there, but we have time for one more. Mike, when the Bigfoot, Daily and Gray, and Whitetail Buck and myself were all in that one single frame of my footage, one of my favorite still photos to date. I want to see that, Mike. I want to see that. Thank you to everybody in the thought of the day. We'll do it all again tomorrow. Thank you to Captain Shirk for the news. And to Butch Witkowski and Strange Days. We'll talk to Butch next year. Year number six that we'll be doing that feature. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brothers watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Space Now Radio. Rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, in your cars, at work, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone participating in our chat rooms on YouTube, LGAP, Spreaker, Revolution Radio, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club on our website, and to all the Starkers and Starcats hanging out on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. You are magnificent tonight. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, say it with me. We're watching. We own the night. Mr. We need a favor. Tomorrow, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we got room for them, too. Good night.